very much for having me. Um, my job within the university, I have a very long title, and I'm the Senior Director Applied Research and Commercialization in the Office of the Vice President Research and Innovation, which is a very, very long title, but it's basically um, myself and my team act as what we call funding Sherpas for companies that are willing to work with the university. Uh, so we apply for a lot of funding, um, research funding that comes to the university, and we help a lot of companies that are interacting <coughs> with Ryerson um, find research funding or find other funding to support themselves. So that kind of gives you a little bit of my credentials. I'm not, um, if, you, if you thought I was going to come here today and talk about kind of the secret pots of money where you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm not going to talk about specific programs. Rather, I'm going to talk about the process for finding money, um, applying for the funding, and what to do with the funding after. So the three parts of the cycle, how do you find uh, grant money that can go into your companies, um, how do you go about getting that money um, from the government, and how do you, once you are successful, ho hopefully, um, what do you need to think about when you receive the funding? Just to get a sense of everybody, are people here, have you started companies? How many people have startup companies? Okay. Uh, how many people are thinking about startup companies? Okay. How many people are just, they just want to know what's going on? Okay. So starting with the how do you find funding, the government um, and we'll talk about this in a, in a second, but when I talk about governments, I'm talking about the federal government, the provincial government, the municipal government, gives away uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year um, for R&D that's happening in Canada uh, to support um, job creation in Canada. Um, kind of the, the gamut of things that you as a company might be interested in. Uh, the government probably has some sort of program that covers it. Um, it's very easy when you talk about government funding to get lost in the weeds. That uh, a lot of the companies that we talk to say this is all fantastic but there's just so much I don't know where to start. So one of the things that when you're talking about government funding, um, it's important for you as a company or an individual to think about what do I want the funding for? Everybody wants money. We'll accept that, yes, you want money because money is good. Um, but what specifically are you looking for the money for? Are you looking for the money to uh, advance R&D to move your uh, technology forward? Are you looking for money to, um, to help hire, um, bring on people and hire in your organization? Um, are you looking for money to expand to go global? Are you looking for money to help you um, market your technology better and do market research? So these are all different pots of money that you can um, look for. But the most important thing when you start the process of thinking about government money is what do I as a company want the money for? Um, we see a lot of companies that will jump on um, and spend a lot of time um, jumping on different calls for funding that comes out and will contort themselves to fit the funding. So all of a sudden they find that they've got a lot of funding to do something that's not core to their business and they really have no interest in doing. It's not driving them forward as a company. So they have the money, um, but now they're stuck doing something that they don't want to do. So it's very important when you start this process to say, what are my priorities in terms of funding? What do I need the funding for right now to help me through the next stage of my business? Uh, there's all different types of funding that you can get from the government. Um, you can get contracts. So the government actually spends a lot of money um, to buy goods and services from the Canadian public. Um, uh, so that is the, the government acting as a client um, and that they will put out RFPs, requests for proposals 
for, uh, for people to supply them with technology, for people to supply them with services. Uh, both the Canadian and the provincial government have been doing a lot in the last number of years to recognize that, um, and this, uh, um, Glenn Murray, who was our former Minister of uh, Research and Innovation, he's now Climate and Environment and Climate Change, um, said it, the, the seminal moment for him was that he went to um, China and he saw a presentation of technologies and it was an Ontario company that was having their technology used in China that was being presented back to him because it was too hard for the company to actually get the Ontario government uh, to try the technology here, that they had to go to China to get the government to try, uh, to try it. So ever since that moment, which was about five years ago, they've been doing a lot more in Ontario and in the federal government to have um, both levels of government and in the municipal government to have both levels of government act as the first customer or the beta tester for technologies. So it's well worth um, you thinking about that. This is a type of, tech, uh, a type of funding, however, that um, can send you down the rabbit hole, so to speak, in that uh, you apply for the funding and you, it's not quite core to what you want to do, but all of a sudden you're supplying a technology or having to do something um, that isn't in your uh, core bailiwick. It is profit though. Like when they're paying you, they're paying you as a supplier of a good or supplier of a service. So this is, they are a customer. Uh, there's uh, money that are grants or contributions. Uh, a grant is exactly what it, what it sounds like. Here's some money, do some stuff. A contribution is usually funding that the government gives out that's matched to other money that you're spending. So they will co-fund a project, uh, usually on a one-to-one -one basis. Maybe uh, um, they'll put in 75%, you have to put in 25%. Um, this is um, incentive money, and it's usually tied to a specific goal of a program that the company has. So it might be around job creation, uh, it might be around new company creation, um, but the, the grant and the contribution money is free money. Um, there are um, programs that the government has to give out loans or cash advances. A lot of this is through the federal government. It's uh, through the Business Development Bank of Canada, for example. Uh, Futurepreneur has some money that they'll give out. Um, it is a loan. Um, so it is not free money. Uh, you have to pay the money back. Uh, oftentimes it's forgivable loans or it might be loaned on a better um, basis than it could be if you went to Canada Trust or, the, um, uh, or any other banking institution. But do keep that in mind. Uh, it's not, uh, there's programs that are grants, here's free money. There's programs that are loans. Um, one of the Examples of this is the Canadian Media Fund, um, which they will give you the upfront money in a grant type model. However, if you read the fine print of the contract, you, if you make money, you have to repay their money back to them. So it's very important that you recognize when you're getting the money, whether it's coming as a grant, here's some money, or whether it's coming as a, a, a loan truly a loan that has uh, conditions attached to it. Um, one of the most overlooked types of government funding there is for everything that you guys are doing um, is something called the SHRED program. <coughs> the SHRED program is the, it's S, R, and E, D. Scientific Research uh, and Experimental Development. So this is a tax credit program that is offered federally and provincially, so they go together on it. And it enables um, you to get back, if you're doing it badly, um, 50 cents, if you're doing it well, 75 per, uh, cents on every dollar that you spend on R&D in Ontario. 
for any company that is uh, a small company, such as all of you, less than 100 people, you get that funding back as cash. It's basically when you file your taxes at the end of the year, they, it's, you get it back as a check. Um, if you're a larger company like Monsanto and Company, they get it back as tax credits uh, against future profit. Um, but for any small company in Canada, if you spend $100 on R&D first year, you get the $75 back the second year. You spend that $75 you should get back, say, $50 the next year. So you can keep going on that $100 that you spent in the first year for a number of years until it peters out. Uh, so you should all be looking at the SHRED program, and you should all be filing for SHRED credits at the end of the year. Uh, I will say it is hard, harder for service companies uh, to get SHRED uh, credits, but if you're doing any sort of technology development, uh, creating any sort of um, uh, even digital technology, not necessarily a website, but if there's any kind of R&D behind the back end of what you're doing, you should, this is free government money you should all be taking advantage of. Pardon me. Um, there are a lot of programs, especially in Ontario, that have been introduced um, as wage subsidies to hire staff. Um, to hire, um, to help you hire and train your staff. Um, a lot of it comes down to hiring youth, so getting youth involved. Uh, so it's well worth you looking at uh, those programs if you're trying to ramp up and expand the business that you have by bringing on um, new people. So this is great. You tell me there's all kinds of money out there. You say it's falling from the trees, but I don't know where it is. Where do I look for it? So as I mentioned, all levels of government give away funding in Canada uh, for startups and for new companies. So there's federal programs, there are provincial programs, there's municipal programs, and then the other thing that you need to understand is a lot of times, the federal and the provincial governments will give the money to other organizations to give out. So for example, um, last year, the Ontario government gave to Ryerson 500,000 uh, to give out under the Social Enterprise Demonstration Fund um, that we will be giving out uh, to social innovation companies in the form of seed grants. So it is provincial money, but the money is given out through agencies or other uh, entities that deliver the programs for them. Um, so it's important to kind of think about and recognize who those agencies are that are giving out the funding. Um, there are a number of programs, government programs that are standing programs. So have any of you applied for, for example, the Ontario Centers of Excellence uh, Smart Start? Funding, funding for entrepreneurs, two, only two. It's $30,000 uh, that can go to uh, startup companies, especially if you're associated with a campus linked accelerator, which if you're all in the Ryerson ecosystem, you are. Uh, it's given out $30,000 matched to $30,000 that you spend. So you'll be spending a total of $60,000, you'll get back $30,000. It's a check written to your company. Uh, that program is a standing program that's offered by the Ontario Centers of Excellence uh, with a continuous intake of applications. So you can apply at any time. They do have certain times once a month they adjudicate applications. So it's important to understand when they have the uh, do the adjudication because otherwise you'll if you apply the day after the adjudication, you're going to wait a month until they have the next adjudication. But it's a standing program uh, that is uh, delivered all the time. There's other programs that are one-offs, that there's a certain call for funding. Um, it happens, um, it might happen once, it might happen once a year, 
Uh, it could be that it'll happen periodically when the government has funding. For those programs, you need to, um, unfortunately, you kind of need to be watching all of the time uh, because if you miss it, it's not necessarily coming back again. So if any of you are, for example, developing uh, energy technologies, the Ministry of Energy has a uh, program out, which I think the deadline is November 30th, uh, that is helping uh, startup companies that want to uh, test their technologies and advance their smart grid and other energy storage technologies on the grid. Um, this call is November 30th. Uh, you have to have done the call by November 30th. Um, but it's a program, for example, that happens like twice a year. Uh, you don't necessarily know when the calls are out. So that brings me to the second point. When, how do you find out about these things? You need to get on lists. There are all sorts of organizations um, around in the Toronto ecosystem that are around to support you as startup companies moving forward. Um, these organizations, uh, even though we kind of compete with each other, um, are not mutually exclusive. So if you are in the Ryerson zone ecosystem, for example, it does not mean that we don't want you to be on Communitex list of um, when they send out emails. It does not mean that we don't want you to be a member of the local regional innovation center, which is Mars, just down the street. Um, you should be talking to IRAP. All of you should be on IRAP's list. It is the Industrial Research Assistance Program. Um, so it is, again, funding that goes out to startup companies and small companies uh, in Canada to help them move their technologies forward. So these company, these organizations and these listservs that you get on uh, will push stuff out to you uh, so that you can see it um, when, when there's a call for funding. The other advantage of being on their list is especially with IRAP and Mars in the, uh, uh, as the regional innovation center, Oftentimes, what will happen is, especially when you get to the end of a funding year, uh, the government will have to dump money. So some government agencies will have to dump quickly some of their budget uh, before it gets to uh, April 1st. Uh, and so they will dump their budget by going to IRAP, for example, and saying, hey, we need to get rid of this much money uh, very quickly. How can we do it? And IRAP will put out a call to their list. Um, Mars, uh, Mars, the Regional Innovation Center, for example, has a program um, called BAP, which helps you, I don't even know what it stands for, BAP, um, that helps you hire, um, helps you hire I embedded executives into your company and has another program that helps you hire um, a kind of first time um, employee. They'll give you up to 60,000 for the embedded executive, we'll give you 30,000 uh, for the kind of first time employee on a cost sharing basis. Again, if you're not on their list, they don't advertise these out to the world, they advertise it to their list. If you're not on the list, you won't find out about it. Um, so it is, it clogs up your inbox. If you can create another email address that this, you can sign up with these things, um, that'd be great. But you need to be on these lists to find out about the funding that comes out. Uh, the City of Toronto also has, through Enterprise Toronto, has another really good list that they push out um, opportunities, funding opportunities, especially from the city level. Uh, we try and push out things through Ryerson, through the zone network, uh, so pay attention to the newsletters that come out uh, from Ryerson and you will see things. If you are looking for the contract funding from the, uh, from the federal, provincial, municipal government, um, there's something called MERCS, M-E-R-X, uh, it is a database of 
RFPs that are available. Uh, you can search Mercs and see all of the things that the all levels of government are spending. Sometimes it's very fun to search Mercs if you're just bored to see, oh look, they're buying submarines, or oh look, they're buying snowshoes. Um, but it's well worth going and looking at Mercs. You can set up alerts on Mercs so that if there's a certain type of um, RFP that you're looking for, it will email you and let you know that something's been put up in that space. Uh, oftentimes, you need to pay for the RFPs off of Mercs. Uh, Ryerson has an account. Uh, so if there is one that you want, uh, just email us and let us know and we can pull it for you if you just want to look at it. Oftentimes, to apply, you need to have gone on to Mercs and downloaded it yourself um, to get on the qualified bidders list. Um, we'll talk about that a bit later. The City of Toronto also has a, um, an RFP database that they post everything that the City of Toronto is buying for. Buying. So anytime the City of Toronto or the federal or provincial government wants to spend more than $25,000, uh, anytime a hospital or a university in uh, Ontario wants to spend more than $25,000 on something, we have to put out an RFP, and we all generally put it out through Mercs. Uh, so it's well worth, if, you're, if you have technologies that are at a point that you could sell them, to just go and look and see what people are buying. Um, the other benefit to being within the zone ecosystem is that you have a whole lot of other people that are just ahead of you in terms of moving their companies forward. They might be just behind you, or they're at the same space. So there's a lot of company, uh, there's a lot of individuals um, in the ecosystem that have applied for the funding, that have uh, seen funding opportunities come their way because they're on various lists. Uh, they've received the funding, so it's well worth just talking to other people uh, and saying, hey, have you tried for the OCE startup seed funding? Have you seen anything? Have you done any of the programs for wage subsidies and the like? Uh, so just a lot of the ways that you can find out what's out there uh, is just by talking to other people in the ecosystem and see what they hear and what they're applying for. Um, and then finally, it is amazing if you search government funding wage subsidies Ontario student, there's all kinds of stuff that will come up. Uh, it's quite amazing. I talk to, I do office hours in a number of the zones, and I have companies come in all the time and they say, we want, we want funding for a uh, student. And I'm saying, well, where have you looked? And they say, well, we haven't done everything. And I'm like, you just do the search. Like, just Google it. Uh, you'll get all kinds of stuff coming up. Uh, quite easily. So there's the governments, uh, all levels of government have done a really good job in Canada um, about putting up information about their programs. Uh, there are some challenges though when you do Google, Google searches that uh, some of, they don't take stuff down. They put up stuff and they leave it up. Uh, so do check and see, there'll always be information about when the last call has been. But, but before you get too excited about something, uh, it's often that you'll go, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I'm looking for. And they haven't given the funding out for the last three years. Um, but just, um, it will all be up there. So just go and look at uh, um, Business Canada, uh, the province of Ontario, and things like that. And you'll be able to find funding. Some of the places, just to give you a where to in all of this, kind of where to start. Uh, a lot of the provincial money for startups is given out through the Ontario Centres of Excellence. So if you go there and look at their programs, get on their list. Uh, the Ministry of Research and Innovation uh, gives out a lot of money to the startups. They give it to OCE to administer. But a lot of the times, if you watch for releases from MRI, you can see where, who they're giving the funding to, uh, to give out. So for example, the SEDF funding we have uh, came from 
MRI, so the social innovation seed funding we have, came from MRI. They gave it out to a number of organizations in Ontario. So if you watch to see who they give it out to, you can follow the money to who's going to give it out eventually. Um, if you're doing subsidy, um, if you're looking for wage subsidies, um, or if you are under 29, uh, the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, MTCU, uh, is a good place to start because it has a lot of the wage subsidy or support for young entrepreneurs. So it has a lot of the youth funding that they're giving out that tends to be funding um, uh, for entrepreneurship startups uh, or to help um, people get training. Uh, so it'll support, subsidize you hiring someone. Um, on the federal level, uh, two places for you to start, IRAP, so the Industrial Research Assistance Program. Uh, it is designed to give money out to companies. Um, the Federal Development Agency for Southern Ontario is another organization that has been set up. It's a federal organization that's been set up to help drive innovation in companies, small, medium-sized companies in um, southern Ontario, which is basically from Ottawa down. We're in southern Ontario. Uh, so it's a good place to go look at their programs. Uh, I had mentioned from the city, the municipal side, Toronto Enterprise has a very uh, a good list, um, and it is basically the incubation and startup support uh, within the city. So just for the end of finding funding, some things that people ask me all the time, um, or just some final thoughts on this, this portion. Um, should I pay for funding leads? There's a lot of organizations out there that you pay them $100 and they'll give you lists. They'll give you lists tailored exactly to what you're looking for. Um, I have never seen, we've actually paid for lists. I, we've hired consultant companies to go out and give us funding that we should be going after. Um, I admittedly am a bit better educated than the normal person on a lot of these government pro programs, but I've never seen anything on any of these lists that I couldn't get through a web search myself, or I couldn't get from having asked somebody, or I couldn't get from having spent a couple hours on the computer. And a lot of the times, it seems to me that they're pulling off publicly available databases anyway. Um, so would I ever pay for a funding lead? Not if it's a general funding lead. If you're looking for very, something very specific and someone to give you an introduction to the Minister of Energy that's going to give you a one-time grant, okay, maybe. Uh, but just in terms of the kind of everyday, hey, can you give me all the wage subsidy information? Um, it's, it's easier for you to go look for that yourself. Um, something that's also very important when you're looking for government funding is um, making yourself known to the government. We bring all kinds of people through the zones here. Uh, we host government delegations all the time. We have gover uh, government, all layers of government love coming here to do announcements because they can have their ministers around talking to companies and things like that. Um, the government likes having technologies that they can show and tell to visitors when they come. They like br having entrepreneurs that they can have participate in roundtables. They like pushing other people's technologies when they go out, uh, so if they go to New York. So the only way that they can do that for you is if they know who you are. They're more than willing you might not talk to the minister, but if you're doing something in the energy sphere, find a deputy minister that's interested in the area that you're working with and just say, hey, can I send you some information on what we're doing? If you're dealing with a technology that helps uh, um, with training, for example, or for testing of new um, 
testing of people that are coming into the country for their English levels, for example. Go talk to somebody at the Ministry of Trading Colleges and Universities. So you're on their radar. They know what's going on. Oftentimes, and this is always scary, but I have a number of friends that work for the government. Uh, and it's amazing how many times when it's budget day, they'll call down and say, we have an extra $2 million. We have to put the budget in in the next four hours. Give me some programs. Uh, and they go, OK. And they go through their little, and they say, OK, you can fund this and this and this. And they say, perfect, great. And it gets stuck in the budget. We think it's all some big process. It doesn't work like that. It's all last minute. Um, so you need to introduce yourself to government so that they know who you are. So that if they are going on a trade mission and to China talking about water technologies and they want to bring a couple startups with them, they go, hey, there was that guy that we talked to that was presentable and could talk about water technologies and would be a good ambassador for Canada or Ontario. Let's take him with us. Uh, and they often do that. Um, and the only way they know who you are is if you make yourself known to them. So it could be you could just send them your send them a brochure, send them a paper, send them an email. Um, you might not get anything back, but then when it comes time for them to need something, all of a sudden they'll say, "Hey, there was that person that con called us. Let's call them." Um, think outside the box. You don't always need to wait for a call, and this comes again to the the funding cycles. Um, we tend to do this a lot in the university when we're looking for research funding. Um, the government year ends, the government funding cycle goes from April 1st to March 31st. So the government year end is March 31st. <coughs> All levels of government work on a use it or lose it. So if they don't, they don't necessarily get to carry forward money from one year to the next. If a government, um, governments are perpetually looking to cut budgets, so if a department has underspent, uh, they will lose that money and they will probably not get it back the next year. So we, they are always, come about February, March, uh, looking for places to spend money because they need to get it off their books. So we will often, as a university, send in proposals. Some are big proposals, some are little proposals, $10,000, $25,000. Sheldon likes sending in million dollar proposals that work. Um, but it's here's, here's, some, um, here's something that you could fund. Here's the technology that you could pilot in, in your clinics. Here's some um, technology that you could use. Here is something that we could partner on to kind of drive this forward. You send it in, just a two-page proposal. It's called an unsolicited proposal. It sits in a drawer until all of a sudden they panic at the end of the year and they need to spend <coughs> money and then they pull out this whole pile of unsolicited proposals that they have and they go through them and you will get a call saying, can you do this in two weeks? And you go, yes, I can. I can do it. Cut me a check and I can do what you want me to do. Um, so you don't always have to wait for a call. And this goes back to like make yourself known. Just, you can just send stuff in to the government and propose it. Uh, the other thing, being from a university, we need to push this. There's all kinds of funding that is available not to companies. Companies can't get it, uh, but it's available to universities, not-for-profits, or other uh, communities. So you can partner with them. They apply for the funding. You can get the benefit of the funding. So just going back to the think outside the box. Um, here is an example of it. Um, FedDev has a program, the Federal Development Agency for Southern Ontario has a program called Investing in Business Growth and Productivity. I'm just going to read this for you. It's for small and medium-sized enterprises with at least 15 employees, a sustainable business model, and a profitable track record 
with the potential to become a strong global player. And it supports eligible SMEs to undertake activities related to facilities improvement or expansion, market development, business opportunity development. Um, here's the key. Adapting or adopting new technologies, processes, and related skills development. Um, they'll give a company up to 20 million for this, um, or 25% of the eligible project costs. So I've talked to a lot of companies in the digital media zone. And they say, sorry, the DMZ now. Uh, and they say, well, this is great, Jen, but I don't have 15 employees. Like, I, I just don't have that many employees. And I say, well, that's fine. You don't have that many employees. But the customer that you are trying to sell your technology to that is going to help that customer um, adapt or adopt a new technology to drive them forward, they have 15 employees. So why don't you go to them and say, I'm trying to sell you this technology, and the two of us could go to the Federal Development Agency for Southern Ontario and get up to $20 million to help subsidize you, my client, to adopt my technology. So you're using government funding to basically help you create a market for your technology. So the company that you're talking to might not be able to afford the technology, but there might be a government program out there that they can apply to, to use that funding to buy your technology. So that's how you need to think outside the box. So don't look at this and say, well, this doesn't work for me. I have under, I have under 15 employees. I'm not going to do anything. Think about all the people that you're dealing with. So one of the companies that I was talking to was um, they were dealing with uh, um, uh, food, uh, restaurants, so like Tim Hortons and things like this. And they said, so the other side of it, they said, well, Jen, Tim Hortons has way more than 15. It has, they're not a SME. Like they have, they're hundreds of thousands. They're over, the top level is usually a thousand for a SME in uh, Canada. I said, yes, but you're not thinking about, like, Tim Hortons has over a thousand people, but each franchise of Tim Hortons is a, is a separate company. And each franchise of Tim Hortons has under 15 people. So why don't you get a whole bunch of franchisees that are willing to go in together and take the whole group of them to FedDev and pitch the technology? So it worked. Um, so again, think about how you can, maybe not, you're not applying directly, but you can apply with consortium or other people um, to make use of the government funding programs. OK, so let's say that you found funding. You found something that this is it. This is perfect. Now that you're going to apply for the funding, what do you need to think about? So the main thing when you're applying for government funding, when you're writing the application, going through the application process, is understand your audience. Um, understand who is reviewing the proposal. Are they specialists in the area, or are they generalists? Understand what the motivations of the program are. And in any government program, they will tell you why they're spending the money. So if the motivation of the program is to create jobs, when you write your application, you need to talk about how your technology is going to create jobs and empower youth and create a better economy where more people can get hired. Don't talk about how your technology is a great efficiency maker and means that all kinds of people in the service industry are going to get fired because you can now have one, your technology do something that it used to take five people to do. Um, so understand the motivations and understand what the 
what the, um, the program is trying to achieve at the end of the day. And so approach your application with that mindset. So whenever you see the calls come out, there's a whole lot of ancillary information around. Read the information. It's painful. It's boring. Um, but you need to read it to understand the motivation of why they're spending the money so that you can tailor your application. Uh, it's also helpful sometimes to, uh, in terms of who's reviewing the proposal, uh, understand the motivations of the, the people. So um, uh, when Jim Flaherty was alive, uh, the finance minister, his, uh, uh, Jim Flaherty's um, child has autism. Um, so while he seems like a person that wouldn't be kind of interested in the fluffy like things to help kids and stuff like that, he has a kid with a disability. So he was always interested in technologies or projects that would help um, people with disabilities, especially young children. So if you get kind of information like that, and all of this, it's easy enough to do a Google search on any government person and understand kind of where they're coming from when they're reviewing the applications. Okay, this seems simple. I deal with very, very smart people in the university, our faculty members, very smart people. They can build rockets. They can hopefully one day cure cancer. They seem to have a hard time reading the instructions of grant, grant calls. They're very clear um, and they're unforgiving. So part of the government tendering and government application process is they have a lot of rules. They have a lot of applications. The easiest way for them to do their first cut of the applications is basically toss out everyone that did not follow the rules. Um, and so it's things like, if they say, we want you to use 12 point font with three quarter inch margins, use 12 point font, three quarter inch margins. Don't get creative, they don't like creative. They want 12 point font, three quarter inch margins. Um, if they say it is due at five o'clock on this day, it is due at five o'clock on that day. Like you have to oftentimes go and show up and there's a little person with a stamp and they stamp it. And if you show up at 501, um, too bad, so sad. Even if there was a fire and the whole of the TT TTC was shut down and there was no, and your cat was run over, and they don't care. It's, if they say five o'clock on this day, it is due at five o'clock on that day. They can't take it after that. So build that in. There are deadlines for questions. So there is a date at which they will accept questions. Um, they can't answer questions after that date. Uh, so if you're looking at it late and you have a question, they can't talk to you about it. Uh, so keep that in mind. And this comes down to, again, read the call. Read the call, read the rules. Just spend an hour going through all the material at the beginning. It is painful. It feels like you're wasting time. Uh, but it makes you much happier at the end of the day. We had one that... Uh, Government deadlines are usually 12 o'clock, midnight. Um, and it's usually that you can submit online. You could send it in. Uh, we had one that we didn't, we didn't read the directions. Um, and so like we had been, it, it was a big application. We had been working like for a month on it. And then suddenly somebody goes, you realize like this is due in person in Ottawa at five o'clock. And we all went, what? Like we're in Toronto and it's like two o'clock. And we went like this, how, how are we gonna, like what, we've been working on this for a month. Like what the hell? Why did no one know what is this? Why did no one read the direction? So thankfully we have friends in Ottawa. We have the University of Ottawa there. We could call and say we're emailing you something. Um, can someone print it and run it over to the, uh, 
to the government for us. They'll, we'll do it for them if we're in Toronto. Uh, but we know people in Ottawa that would do it for us. Uh, if we didn't, we would have just spent a month like wasting our time uh, working on something that we couldn't, we couldn't apply for or that we missed, like we missed the application. Uh, we have also hit submit uh, two minutes late because oftentimes a whole bunch of people on the online systems are trying to upload their stuff uh, and trying to all hit submit at the same time and the system basically chugs. So you're hitting submit and you missed it by two minutes. You can't do anything about it. And unless you have a, like a really good excuse, we had one we could use. There was a power outage in Toronto at uh, the deadline date. And even though the power outage actually didn't affect Ryerson, we could say there was a power outage. And they went, OK, you can have another day. Um, respect the page limits. So they will say, we want 10 pages. It's not. It's 10 pages plus a little bit. It's 10 pages. Uh, they will throw out your application uh, if, you're over the, uh, um, if you're over the maximum. Or they'll just throw out every page after 10 pages. Um, so do respect page limits. The other thing is, if they say, um, they'll often say, we would like three th this section of the proposal should have 3,000 words, uh, maximum 3,000 words. If it says maximum 3,000 words, write at minimum 2,500 words and try and get as close to 3,000 words as you can. If they say this section should be 3,000 words, do not write one sentence. So the page limits, as well as telling you what you can't go over, should give you an idea of where they want more detail. Um, so if they want, say in one section that they want 500 words, and in another section that they want 3,000 words, don't fill up the 500 word one and only write two lines for the 3,000 word section. So use the maximums as guides for how much information they want in that section. And try and get as close as you can to whatever they've asked for without going over. So at the end of the day, the goal of your application to the government <laughs> is, is about explaining to them what the benefit that your solution will bring. Why is yours um, going to improve everybody's life? What you need to understand is they're often going to have um, five or six applications that are all equally good. So you all meet the standard. What you need to, un what you need to do in your application is explain to them why they should pick yours over somebody else's. Again, relate it back to what their motivations are in the program. Um, so it could be that your technology is the best technology in the world, but your technology means that you're going to reduce employment, and the goal of the program is to increase employment. Uh, so they're going to pick somebody else's that's going to increase employment. Um, so explain to them what the benefit of your technology is, and what the benefit of your technology is in the context of what they want to achieve with the program. Explain to them why you are the person to deliver. So how is it that you and your team are bringing the expertise that they need uh, to deliver the solution that they need? On the research side, we often um, talk to profs because they spend a lot of time explaining the how, how they are going to do something. A lot of the times that, that your customers and your, your um, in our case, the funders, be an industry or government, they assume that we are intelligent people that can do research, because we're at a university. So they don't want to necessarily know the how. 
They want to know that you are a person that's experienced in this area, that you have a team of people to back you up, that you have the resources to deliver what you say that you're going to deliver. So one of the things, for example, is don't talk about how um, you, unless it's, it's the motivations of the project, uh, the program that you're applying for, don't talk about how uh, you have the technology, you have the ability to support, uh, to provide support for whatever technology you're going to roll out. And then in your budget, talk about how you need to hire a support team. Um, because they're not going to be interested in taking it if there's no one there to support them. So use whatever resources you can, be it advisors, for example, they might not be people in your company, contractors, even if you haven't necessarily hired them, um, say that we have a pool of people that um, we have worked with before and can bring just like that uh, to deploy the solution for you. So even if we don't have the expertise in-house, we have the connections to rapidly bring that expertise in. So it's really talking about um, why should they trust you? So why should they trust you to deliver? Um, in grant applications, this is again, if they ask a question, it's because they want the answer to the question. Um, there is, in most grant programs, there's something called, um, they score them. So you get a score. Think about when you wrote an exam and you get four points for this question and three points for that question and ten points for this question over here. That's exactly how they score um, funding proposals. You get a certain score for different sections. You have to have a minimum cumulative score to get even in the bin of things that are considered before they're ranked. So when you're writing the application, the first thing that you need to do is look at the scoring matrix. And if it says provide two examples of this, provide two examples of this, because you will get one point for each one. So think of it exactly like writing an exam. Answer the question that's asked, and understand how that you're going to get marked. Um, because that's what decides whether you're in the keep bin or the out bin. And it's oftentimes that people will say, but I've done all that stuff. I have like 10 examples. But you didn't write them down in the proper section. You made them hunt for the information. Don't make them hunt for the information. Because oftentimes, um, I've reviewed proposals for grant funding. Um, when I review proposals for grant funding, I'm given a stack like this, and I sit in front of the television, and I'm watching the TV, and I'm going through the proposals, um, and my husband's sitting next to me, who's an ICT guy, and occasionally I'll say, hey, does this make sense? And he'll go, no, that sounds dumb. And I'll go, okay. And, and you just have to, and I'm just quickly looking to score them. And you're going through 100 applications um, that you need to do quickly by a certain time. So make it easy as possible for the people that are reviewing them to give you the marks. If I have to hunt around and try and find examples, um, after a while I'm like, this one's just too difficult. I'm like, I'm, I, you can see something's there but it's just too hard to give them the marks, I'm going to go do an easy one. So just make sure your stuff is easy. Um, provide sources for your references. If you come in and you say, I don't know, give me an example. Android is the number one phone used in the world. If there's no reference for it, I'll say, well, that sounds a bit odd. Like, I don't necessarily think that's the case. Then I'll start Googling things. And the last thing you want when I'm reviewing your proposal is for me to start Googling things. Um, because then I'll immediately say, well, that's not true, and that's not true. And then the worst thing that could happen is I'll Google your technology and see if anybody else has created it in the world. Um, so the easiest thing is to not have anybody, give anybody a reason 
to leave your proposal. So give them a reference. Even if it just says Foresters 2015, I'm not going to go check it. I'm not going to check. I'm not saying lie and make up references. Um, but just find something that sounds like a credible, um, a credible reference when you're making broad sweeping statements or you're quoting stats or you're saying, for example, that Lama, Lama's meat is a $1 billion industry in North America. Maybe it is. I don't know. I would doubt it. Maybe it is. But you give me a reference, I'll believe you. Um, we have available to all of you something called the Mars Market Intelligence Services. So um, Mars has um, licenses to all kinds of reports, market analysis and market research reports that usually cost uh, $3,000, $4,000 a pop. They're available to you for free. Um, you can access them. So you can put in a request to the Mars Market Intelligence Service and say, I would like a specific report. Or you could put in a request and say, I'm interested in selling llama meat in North America. And I would like all the market research on the llama market in North America. Um, and they will gather up all kinds of stuff for you and send it to you. Um, so if you're writing any of these applications for government funding, um, first go to the market intelligence people at Mars and say, give me what you got. And it'll give you all kinds of reports that you can reference. Um, when you're done, have somebody else review the proposal. Preferably have somebody else review the proposal that's not on your team and doesn't understand the technology. If you can have your mom, no offense to moms out there who might be rocket scientists and things like that, but if you can have your mom or your grandmother or your grandfather read the proposal and get what you're talking about, you've done a good job. So get somebody that doesn't understand the area that you're working in. And you will find that person and get somebody that's going to tell you the truth. So if you give it to your mom and your mom goes, oh, that's lovely, honey. You did a great job. That's not what you want. You want somebody that's going to say, you used all these acronyms and you assumed all this information, which I don't have. And I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I'm speaking a little out of turn here, but we had a company pitch. <coughs> I'm on the selection committee for companies coming into the digital media zone. Uh, we had a company pitch to us the other day. They spent their whole pitch session, 15 minutes, talking about why their stuff was better than everybody else's stuff, uh, doing the SWOT analysis for us, talking about kind of the potential for it in terms of the market and everything. And it got to about the 14 minute mark. And I went, you haven't actually explained what you're doing. Like, you, we have no idea what your technology is. Like, you haven't, ex what, are you selling something? Are you providing a service? Like, you have not explained at all what the technology is. And they went, uh, and then we went, Tom, that's it. So, if you get all the way through your proposal and you haven't actually explained what your technology is because you understand it so well and you think everybody else does, that's a problem. You need to have somebody else look at it and say, I don't get it at all. I don't get what you're doing. And then you can go back and rewrite it. Uh, consistency is a big thing. Have people read it for consistency. If you said in one part of the application that Android is the number one phone system in North America, and you say in another one that iPhones are the number one, uh, that's going to be a problem. So have somebody else read it for consistency as well. They will ask you for a detailed budget in all applications. Um, don't make up numbers. So if you say that we need this much for travel, um, go online, go on to Expedia, and figure out how much, it, if you say that you need X amount to fly to New York, Google it and figure out how much it costs to fly to New York and use those numbers in your budget. Uh, one of the th worst things that you can do in an application is use round numbers. It's going to cost me $25,000 to hire a person, and it's going to cost me $8,000 to do something, and everything zeroes out. 
Um, things in life don't zero out. It looks like you just made stuff up. Um, so try and get exact numbers or try and get close numbers that usually have a number of digits in them um, so that things aren't equal. It might be that you're trying to hit an equal number at the end of the day, but budgets are more realistic when it looks like somebody's thought about the number and done some research. Especially if you say, I'm going to New York and the flight's going to cost me $2,000. I'm like, well, it doesn't cost $2,000 to fly to New York. Like, what are you, flying first class? Like, that's not. Um, so try and get the budget numbers as close as possible. Um, give breakdowns on equipment. If you're buying equipment, say, this is how much it will cost. You don't necessarily have to put the um, purchase orders and put in quotes, but try and figure out how much things are going to cost. Give breakdown on salaries. Um, so put in, I'm going to pay this person this much money. Um, if it's an hourly rate or if it's a contractor rate, this is how much I'm going to pay them. Yeah, like, like look for a kind of range. You can figure out if you're planning on flying in, um, if you're planning on flying in July, um, figure out kind of what it costs around in July. Um, don't put in the, the cost for it to when you're flying, I don't know, in February or something like that. Um, but do try and make the number closer to the actual number um, than... Just pick a number out of the air. Um, in a lot of funding calls, proposals, especially if you're dealing with RFPs, they will have the contract terms in your agreement, in the call. So it will say, if you are funded, this is the contract that we're signing. The only time you can change those, any of those terms um, is at the time of proposal. So you can add in what's called an exception to the terms. If you don't put an exception to the terms in your proposal, you're stuck with whatever funding agreement um, it is at the end of the day. So if, for example, government contracts give the government a non-exclusive royalty-free right to use all the um, intellectual property created, if that's not what you want to agree to, you need to put an exception in your proposal. Oftentimes, they don't notice the exceptions. Like, so, but the only way you can negotiate after the fact is if you put something in your proposal in the first instance. So if there is a funding agreement attached, read the funding agreement before you submit the proposal. Um, because otherwise you're stuck with whatever, whatever proposal you're going to get. Do you require um, bonding for the for RFPs? Um, it depends on the, sometimes, sometimes not. It depends on the, um, the program that you're applying to. Uh, oftentimes it'll depend on the uh, amount of money. Um, but if they did, it would be in there. So you'll see it in there. So they can't, insurance is another one. Um, sometimes they'll require a certificate of insurance. Sometimes it's just a pledge that you have the insurance. If it's a certificate of insurance and you don't have those levels of insurance and can't come up with that certificate of insurance, they're not going to cut you a check. Um, so... If that is the requirement, you need to put something in that says something else to give them the ability to negotiate out. Um, otherwise, they can't negotiate on the back end. Um, and then this comes back to my uh, um, understand the submission guidelines. Understand if you're applying online. Understanding if you're applying with paper. Um, oftentimes, with the province, you have to give them 10 copies in binders um, photocopied, single side with uh, associated USB or CD-ROM that has the proposal in this standard. And if you don't build that into your application time, it takes a lot of time to make those copies and assemble everything. If you haven't built that stuff into your application time, 
all of a sudden you'll be scrambling at the end. Um, if, they, uh, if they want it uh, electronically, um, it's understand kind of what format that they want it in. Is it a PDF? Is it a Word document? Um, and make sure that you follow those rules because otherwise it's going to knock you out of the application process. Uh, just so you know, the, um, the Shoppers Drug Mart in the, the AMC building um, stays open late. So the, uh, we've mapped out where all the, um, the post offices are and when they close because part of the submission process is sometimes that you have to have it postmarked that day. Um, so if you know which ones stay open till 11 versus which ones stay open, uh, close at 9 o'clock, it gives you extra time. So the one in the, AM, the bottom of the AMC building in the Shoppers Drug Mart is a late post office. Okay, so you found the funding. Put in your application. Thing that you need to understand about government funding programs is now you wait. And you wait and you wait, and you wait, and they say it'll be about this time, and then you call and you say, what's going on? And they say, oh, <coughs> just wait a bit. Um, so it's not a fast process. Uh, it should be a fast process. It's not a fast process. Oftentimes you put in the application and then stupid things like elections are called, and then everybody has to stop and you can't do anything because they can't do anything during the elections. Um, they can't talk to people or answer any questions. Uh, if the government changes, then you get all these little notices saying, thank you for the application that you submitted two months before the election was called, but we've now, the, the government has changed, um, have decided that we're not doing that program anymore, so it's canceled. So we got a bunch of those, like the week after the uh, Liberals won. They just canceled all kinds of programs. So you have to be prepared for stuff like that. Um, so don't expect that you're going to get the check uh, within kind of four weeks of putting in your application. Um, it never happens. Um, oftentimes even don't expect that you're going to get a check within um, four weeks of having received an award letter. Um, there's agreements that have to be dealt with. It is a slow process. Do keep in your head at the end of the day, especially if it's a grant or something like that, it's free money. So yes, this is time and energy that you need to go through to do this. It can be annoying, but it is free money at the end of the day, so just keep that in mind. Um, when you do get the funding, please understand the conditions of the funding. Read the award letters. Oftentimes, you have a certain amount of time that you have to reply by to accept the award. So that you have to, within X amount of days, say, yes, I do want the funding. If you don't reply within that certain amount of time, um, or you didn't read that, um, you, you've lost it. Um, they, they won't give it to you anymore because they'll have gone on to the next person on the list. Uh, review the funding obligation. So they'll give you a contract or an agreement to sign. You need to understand what it is that you're committing to do. Going back to the Canadian Media Fund, for example, they might be giving you $500,000, but you need to understand that if you ever commercialize something and make money off of it, you need to repay them the money within a certain amount of time. So as long as you understand what the deal is, that's fine. If you haven't read the contracts and you don't get that, um, it can cause problems for you later on. I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm an unusual lawyer in that, I work for a university, but I'm an unusual lawyer in that um, a lot of lawyers will say, you need lawyers to look at every legal agreement. Um, you need lawyers to review all your stuff. Uh, you don't. A lot of the funding agreements you can read and uh, they will make sense. But it might be, especially if you're getting a, like a good chunk of money um, and you're making commitments on behalf of your um, 
making commitments on behalf of your company that you have a lawyer take a look at the agreement. The one thing the lawyer is going to do, because this is what we're trained to do and what we like to do, is uh, we like to review and edit agreements and propose all kinds of revisions. For the most part, you cannot negotiate with the government. They're not interested in negotiating. They don't care. It takes time and energy. They have to go to their lawyers when they do it. They don't like talking to their lawyers. They just want to get the funding out. Um, so going to a lawyer and having a lawyer edit the document is not a good um, investment of your money. Going to a lawyer and just saying, tell me what my obligations are and tell me where I can potentially get into trouble is a good investment of, your money, uh, of your, uh, the funding that you have. But don't go to a lawyer and have them edit the agreement because the government doesn't care. Like you'll have spent all kinds of money and they're not going to change anything. I used to have a standard template that I sent back to CETA that said, on this page, you have spelt this wrong. On this page, like there's a colon here, it should be a period. On this page, you have said this. It was a three-page letter of mistakes in their standard agreement. And they'd send us the standard agreement, and we'd send this letter back every time. And they'd go, oh, that's nice. And then we'd just sign the agreement with the mistakes in it. Like, cause they were not interested in changing it. It went on for about four years till they finally went, oh, we should probably update our agreement. Um, understand any government contract, government funding of any sort, is going to have reporting obligations in it. Partly because all of the government funding that comes out, as I said, they have motivations around what they're doing, they have objectives, they need stats to support how they spent their money, um, and was it a success? So they want people, and they need people to report. A lot of people will get the money and say, oh, great, and go off and do this stuff, and then forget about the reports. Um, the government gets very upset when you forget about the reports. The reporting obligations can be a pain. They can be asked for a lot of minute detail. Um, if you didn't understand the reporting obligations at the beginning of the process, it could be that you're six months in and did not record the stats that they want you to report. So it's very important when you get the funding agreement to understand what the reporting obligations are uh, and start collecting the data that you're going to need to report later. Um, the government will reward companies that are easy to deal with. Um, so oftentimes, for example, Ryerson is fairly easy to deal with in terms of the government. Um, we will in complain internally about all the things that we have to report, but we will give them all kinds of stats that support whatever they want to support. The benefit for Ryerson is that they come back and they say, which they have done just now, we have some extra money we need to spend. We know that you guys can spend it quickly and can give us the reports that they need. What do you want to do with half a million dollars? And we go, OK, here, we're going to do this. And they say, great. So the reporting is a pain in the butt. However, being an easy company for the government means that they'll come and give you stuff later on. Um, so just understand what it is that you need to do, though. Uh, keep records. One of the other things that we run into is you have a budget. You need to spend to the budget. If you said that you're going to spend this much on salaries and this much on travel, you can't switch the money around. You need to spend this much on salaries and this much on travel. If you don't and you submit your stuff to get reimbursed after, they'll say you did not follow the contract, you're not getting your money. Um, so understand the, uh, the reporting obligations. Keep, make sure that you keep records of things because they'll ask for the records and they'll, um, every government agreement has some sort of <coughs> audit clause in it that they can come back and check what you're doing. Um, so that's basically all the information that I have. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, any questions, answer any questions that you have, 
or if people have questions about specific programs, uh, I can try and answer those questions for you.